Hello. Welcome. It is wonderful to see all these beautiful faces. I would imagine many of you feel the way that Erin and I feel. This just feels great. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> We've been looking forward to being in an environment where we just feel like we belong, so we appreciate it, fit in. Um, so I'm Julie Crotty. Uh, I'm an executive coach and talent executive at Bank of America. This is Aaron Less, who's also gonna introduce himself, but we, he's also an executive coach and talent executive, so you're not wondering if he's gonna start signing at any minute or something. <laughs> um, we'll be co-presenting today. Really delighted to have you here. We just wanna, um, as you know, we're talking about the power of vulnerability and also the value and importance of psychological safety and how it impacts or relates to the LGBTQ plus community. So we're delighted to see folks interested in this topic. We think it's pretty important for organizations. We wanna start by introducing ourselves and letting you get to know who is it up here that's talking with me. Um, and we will have you uh, share some ideas at times. Um, but I'll start with my personal. I was married to my wife Patricia in 2012 in New York when it was legal. Um, and then we had our big wedding ceremony a week later in New Jersey where it wasn't legal. And we didn't tell people we were already married. Um, it, we didn't want to spoil it. But I actually recommend it because it gets the jitters out a little bit. Um, and marriage changed our lives. We, um, two years later, had two daughters move in uh, we went for foster to adopt with our daughters, and they were older. Um, they're biological siblings, so they were 8 and 12 when they moved in, and then it took us a year to officially adopt them. They're now 21 uh, and 17, and Angelina is in the bottom. She's studying nursing, and she actually got to study in Cork, Ireland, where my wife and I didn't know this when we met, but we both have extended relatives there, so it was pretty convenient. <laughs> Um, and then our daughter Jasmine is in high school uh, and doing really well, so it's great. And our dog Lonnie, we had him move in soon after the girls, and he's been quite the therapy dog. He did not know what he was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> he's also the only male in the house, and he takes it quite seriously, so he's, <laughs> he's quite alpha. And um, we're like, calm down, you're embarrassing us, man. Um, in terms of my education, that little insignia, I went to Cornell, I kind of overdid it. I did psychology as an undergrad played basketball. I was very fortunate to play overseas in Ireland and New Zealand. Then I decided I had to grow up, so I went back to Cornell for a law degree, wanted a little more variety, so I got an MBA as well. So I'm only sharing that ridiculous tale just so you have a sense of why I think I might have something to say up here. Um, and then from there, I went into mediation. I mediated discrimination cases for New York City and the EEOC, the federal government, for 10 years ran FINRA's mediation program. They're a regulator in the finance industry for 10 years. Then I got into leadership development. I thought, you know what? I want to help people reach their potential so they don't get into all these conflicts that I'm always helping clean up. It's been very rewarding. And from there, I got, became an executive coach. And now, in January, I started with Bank of America as an executive coach, and I love it. Um, great environment. So, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Pleasure to be here with you and to be here with all of you as well. My name's Aaron Les, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I am gay. Uh, I don't have my partner and children, I'm single, but I do have my family of origin here. I have my parents, my five brothers. So I have five brothers, there's six boys, two are gay. My parents won the gay lottery. <laughs> um, at least I think so, and I think they do too. Um, in terms of uh, work, you heard a little bit about our background. Outside of work, I enjoy doing improv comedy, so you can see one of my uh, improv teams I'm part of. Yeah, we got some other improvisers here. So don't raise your expectations too high. That's not a comedy show today. Um, but I am part of an LGBTQ plus uh, improv team called Alphabet Soup. Get it? LGBTQ, L-M-N-O-P-Q-R. So that, and then I also teach meditation and mindfulness, something I'm really, really passionate about, and actually I think connects some to our conversation today. Um, by training, my background, I have a PhD in counseling psychologist, so I was a therapist originally, then evolved and moved into, had a career journey, didn't play basketball, but had a career journey <laughs> that evolved into the organizational space and now do a lot of coaching, which is really exciting. Excellent, and I did forget to say I apologize. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm lesbian, uh, so that's the identity part of it. Um, 
we like to show this slide up front and just ask that you please approach this hour with a growth mindset. Uh, what we mean is hold space for yourself that you have the ability to grow and learn new things in this hour, um, but also for those around you, including in your workplace, that give them room and space to grow as well. Because sometimes we get a fixed mindset about our colleagues or people in our lives, and it doesn't allow them room to grow either. Uh, the perfect, or a good example of a fixed versus growth mindset would be, I'm terrible at math. If you fundamentally believe you're terrible at math, you're probably not gonna get much better at it. If you believe, I'm not great at math right now, but if I work at it, if I decide this is a priority, I will get better. So there's always, in my view, room to grow. And if you think you're not good at vulnerability, maybe you're wrong. <laughs> maybe that can change. So let's start with just grounding ourselves in a definition of vulnerability. So to, for this, we turn to Brene Brown. Uh, many of you may have heard of Brene Brown, right? Author, professor, yeah, maybe some snaps or claps. Um, I've been immersing myself in her work and just self-reflecting an awful lot. But she defines vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, but that it is not weakness, right? That is actually our most accurate measure of courage. Of course, our community is no stranger to vulnerability. To be ourselves in this world requires vulnerability. And of course, it takes a lot of courage. So we're going to explore vulnerability. Why? How does it show up for all employees? How does it show up for leaders? Why is it important in terms of leadership? And why is it important particularly for our community? And what are some of the ways that might be critical? Julie will then talk about psychological safety. So what is psychological safety? Why is it important? How does it relate to inclusion? And just to tee this up from a, from a big picture perspective of this sort of pyramid where we're showing they build upon one another, you can think about inclusion and psychological safety as conditions that other people can provide that make it easier for us to be vulnerable. And then vulnerability is a personal choice we can make and a skill that we can actually develop. So we're gonna go through this and basically this, you know, through the pyramid. We're also gonna pepper in some of our personal stories around these, these aspects of, of engaging other people. And we actually have one of our colleagues, Mia, will, will step up as well on stage for this. And if I could add a little something here, we're gonna pepper back and forth sometimes, so, uh, you know, prepare you for that. Um, but I just wanted to add that when it comes to, you know, psychological safety and inclusion, for those of you who are leaders, what you will be able to take home from this session today is why it matters, what, what, how you define it, but what's the benefit of it, and how you can start applying that in your workplace as a leader, either with your team, if you're the head of an employee network, um, or in you know, whatever it is that you're leading, your line of business. Um, and if you're an individual who is not at a leadership, in a leadership role at this time, we're gonna help give you the business case to bring this home and try to encourage it in your environment if you're able to manage up or encourage it in your team or the people around you. And we genuinely believe that no matter who you are and where you sit in your organization, you can have a positive impact with respect to these concepts. And in part of the business impact, if you add these three uh, you know, ways of being, you could call them up, is being a great place to work. And just wanna call that out as a starting point We've been grateful enough to been recognized in a number of ways over the years at Bank of America, one of which is um, Fortune recognizing us as one of the 100 best place to work, and of course Human Rights Campaign also recognizing us, recognizing us as a best place to work. So let's go specifically into vulnerabilities benefits. So another quote from Brene Brown, no vulnerability, no creativity, no tolerance for failure, no innovation, it's that simple. So one of the benefits is being able to be creative, nimble, innovative. If we're not willing to admit we don't know, if we're not willing to admit when we've gone down the wrong path, we can't shift quickly and fail fast. Learning and growth, you think about the importance of training and development, the cost of training and development, the need for high-skilled employees. If we don't have people who are willing to, again, be vulnerable enough to learn, Self-awareness for all of us, our ability to connect with each other, to be empathic and self-aware, and especially for leaders, how critical that is. And then connection and joy. Think about employee engagement, your ability to retain employees and attract them by having a culture that is safe and where there is uh, vulnerability modeled in the organization.
And then another just quick thing about why this really matters, and we'll get into this further later, is it helps you have extremely high-performing teams and build trust, which is really crucial for operating effectively. So would love to kind of engage you in answering this question. So we're just going to have you kind of shout out maybe words or phrases that come to mind and helping us define what does vulnerability look like at work? What are some examples? Authentic. Authentic. I'm going to repeat because we're being videotaped. So if you think I'm like a parrot, that's why. <laughs> right here. Being transparent about family matters. And in a way, are you talking about like coming out or being out or that type of thing? Or caregiving? Caregiving. Yeah. Yep. Caring for, elders, Caring for elders, younger people. Thank you. Yeah, here. Making mistakes. Making mistakes. Letting, people Letting people in. That's a really important one for building trust as well. Sure. Sharing. 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 Sorry. Humanization. Humanization. Self-identify. Self -identify. Being yourself. So I feel like someone over here was saying something. Showing emotion. Showing emotion. Thank you. That's yeah. great. So great examples. And you've hit a lot of these, right? And so part of it is about could be coming out, right? Self-disclosure. But it could be a lot of other things. And I did hear somebody else shout out, right? Admitting a mistake, asking for help, disagreeing with the group. We know that how hard that is. But what if we don't? I mean, think about the consequences of that. So. As I was preparing, of course, I've been doing a lot of self-reflection, listening to Brene Brown, thinking about vulnerability, and thinking about my examples at work. And one that came to mind for me was actually at a prior employer. This was a while back. I was at the job for about a year, and I sort of realized I, I had not come out. This wasn't really intentional, per se. It was actually, I think I was getting a feel for the culture, probably unconsciously just getting a feel. I'd moved from the Midwest, which is where I'm from, to North Carolina in the South. I was still getting a feel. What is the general culture and safety here? And, and again, I mentioned you know, being single, and I feel like my experience, it's been harder to have the sort of natural excuse. Sometimes it, it feels I don't have that. I can just mention or have a photo on my desk or something like that as an easy gateway. So all those reasons I hadn't come out. And it was actually at a local sort of regional professional development conference. Was driving back with, another, with a colleague who I knew but was not like close with. And she started sharing with me a little bit about some health challenges that she was dealing with, some things in her relationship. And suddenly that opened up the floodgates, right? I was feeling able and willing and told her, you know, came out to her. And from that point forward, I think something just completely shifted in my engagement at work in terms of my connection with the team, in terms of my feeling of being willing to share my voice, in terms of a sense of belonging. So it's really interesting how her being vulnerable helped me be vulnerable. And then that suddenly allowed me to feel safe. So that's a general sort of understanding of vulnerability in the workplace. Now I want to turn to this discussion really about leadership. Right? And here there's a quote from uh, leadership development consultant Mark Murphy, admitting that we don't have all the answers. It's critical for leaders to earn trust and buy-in. Have you ever had one of those leaders who, who has all the answers? <laughs> do, you feel, do you feel like you want to share your ideas? Probably not. And I have to say, for those leaders, that is a treadmill that you don't really want to be on because you never will have all the answers, and it takes so much energy to pretend that you do. Yeah, and you're not going to have the, as good of outcomes. There's actually an interesting story from Ford Motor Company that I read about. Back in 2006, they were on the verge of bankruptcy, and they brought in a new CEO, Alan Mulally, and he did something somewhat unconventional. Um, he brought you know, his CFO, his senior operations leaders together, and he also brought in the senior leadership of the unions. And he said, basically, let's open up the books for everybody to see what's going on. Let's figure this out together. And they made some really, really tough decisions, but they did it together to save the company, to save as many people's jobs as possible. In 2014, he retired. By then, they'd actually posted 19 consecutive profitable quarters. So if you need sort of the return on investment argument, that's one of them, maybe a dramatic one. And that might be one of the ways that leadership, leaders can be vulnerable, right? Admitting they don't know, asking for help, could show up in a lot of different ways as well in terms of self-disclosure, being frank and honest, that sort of thing as well. Talk about leaders. Now I want to come to our community, the LGBTQ plus community. And we want to talk about covering. How many people have heard this term covering? 
focusing widely, right, this idea of hiding one or more aspect of yourself. A relatively recent Deloitte study actually looked at this across groups, uh, including a lot of marginalized groups, and what they found was actually LGBTQ plus folks actually tend to cover the most of the groups they study, 83% of the time covering more than one or more parts of themselves at work. So it's not still safe necessarily always, or we certainly don't always feel that way. Another study shows about 40% of LGBTQ plus folks are still not out at work. Those that are not out, about a quarter of them wish they could be. Those who are out at work, actually 54% are not out to their clients or customers. Does anybody have that experience? You're out at work, everybody knows, but with your clients or customers, you know, maybe it's a little more variable. And then 75% have experienced at least one or more uh, adverse sort of interaction at work related to their identity. So I just put this up there not to be gloom and doom, but just to acknowledge, right, we still face unwelcoming situations, and sometimes I, I, hostile situations. Sorry, I, I just want to add one little tidbit that I thought was interesting too, because as those of us who are out at work know, it's not a one-shot deal. So even those folks who were out, 36% of the time, at one point or another, were not out. So we all have situations you know, peppered at us throughout our day where sometimes something will come up and someone will maybe try to set poor Aaron up with this beautiful woman um, or may you know, make an assumption that I have a husband because I have kids. You know, and it's, do I mention it, don't I? You know, it, it can drain us a little bit to have to go through that. Yeah, so some of these statistics might seem like a, a dire situation, but actually there's some really, really good news about the impact of coming out. So people who come out, research, recent research shows, feel um, are two times more psychologically safe in general. Of course, part of that might be the situation that creates enough safety. Some of it may be that once you come out, you actually start feeling safer because you've taken that risk. They feel one and a half times more empowered than those who have not come out, and one and a half times more willing to take creative risks, and that falls into that category, certainly, of vulnerability. So it doesn't mean it's easy. This quote actually is a reminder to me of, of how I can offer as a gift, right? Because vulnerability is the first thing that we look for in other people. When somebody else is being vulnerable, like my colleague, it makes us so grateful, like somebody else is human. But it's usually the last thing we want other people to see in ourselves. Um, it makes me think of Titus's discussion yesterday and his comment. One of them was, um, never underestimate your ability to create space for yourself. And of course, when we create space for ourselves, we create space for other people, whether we intend to or not. So really powerful. So at this point, we might be thinking, uh, and I'm curious, what do you think, a little pop quiz, is vulnerability always the right strategy? You've right, probably not, been thinking that a long time while you're listening, haven't you? <laughs> so not always, right, this idea that vulnerability without boundaries is not vulnerability. If we're just sort of oversharing and just sort of uh, putting everything out there in a sort of one directional way, that can sometimes actually be a way of distancing and pushing people away. So this question is, how do we manage the balance, right, and have the appropriate way of being vulnerable? No hard and fast rules, but here's some questions you might consider. One is, what is my intention in sharing, right? Is my intention to work, move the work forward? Is my intention to foster connection? Or is it to sort of unload my baggage at work and work things through in a way that you know, may be a little too unfiltered? So we have to be conscious of why am I doing this? What is the purpose? Then to think about who am I doing this with? Who am I sharing with? Is this a person who's earned enough of the right to hear my story? Do I feel safe enough? Of course, sometimes we take a bigger risk than others, but are we at least being conscious of that? And then the timing piece. So to consider, you know, is this the right time? Is this person distracted and stressed out uh, or this group? Um, is there enough time to actually go into this in some way? And does it feel right for me? It's very critical. So I want to turn back to you one more time here for just open kind of sharing or shouting out of brief answers. What makes it possible for you to be vulnerable at work? Context clues from coworkers. Context clues from coworkers. Context clues, clues from coworkers. Yeah, so those subtle indications, yeah. Somebody said safety. Community. Community. Yes, somebody being vulnerable first, yeah. absolutely. Yes? Acceptance. Self-acceptance. Self ah. That's a good one. Support. HR support, so not being out there by yourself, for sure. Representation. representation. Nice. And leadership representation is important, too. Trust. Trust. Allies. 
allies. Great. Those are good. So we'll move on to the foundation that can help create all the things that you're talking about that make it possible to be vulnerable appropriately with boundaries at work. <laughs> um, we didn't put inclusion in our title, but we're, we want you to know that we're operating with the assumption that all of this is within the context of inclusion and that inclusion is very, very important as part of this. One reason we didn't is because we know it's super important and it's being discussed quite a bit at the conference already, but we definitely wanted to make the point that that's part of the foundation of the pyramid to enable this to happen. And with that in mind, I wanted to tell a story uh, that sort of ties some of this together. Um, and it was when I was interviewing to start with Bank of America, and as I said, I started in January. I'm very fortunate, and I recognize it's a privilege, but I'm at a stage in my life where I've been able to decide that I'm just gonna have to be myself wherever I work. And if I can't be myself, I just, I'm at a point where I'm not willing to do it. So I decided that I need to be out in my interviews, and I don't mean, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> I don't recommend that. Um, so that's not how I did it. But I knew, as you saw in my family, you know, one of the key questions is, why now? I was in consulting, you know, leadership development consulting. Why do you want to move in-house to a company? And the truth is, it's a phenomenal job that I didn't even know existed, and I was super excited. But it's also that I have one child in college, another one getting ready for college, and a little more stability is really good right now. Um, so it was really good timing. So I could explain that and just casually mention, you know, because of my situation with my wife and my teenage kids. Um, and what I didn't realize, so that was being vulnerable without necessarily knowing if I had psychological safety, except that I had it within myself because I knew I was secure enough financially that I could be a little more picky um, and that emotionally that would create the psychological safety that I need. But what I didn't realize was it was screening out organizations. I mean, I was intentionally screening out organizations that wouldn't be a good fit, but I didn't realize it helped me find an organization where the people I was interviewing were like, Julie's gonna, you know, she's gonna blossom here. Like, this is a good environment for her. I had no idea that Bank of America had such a rich LGBTQ plus community and, you know, welcome mat, if you will. So it ended up being exceptionally beneficial for me to be able to be vulnerable in that way. I want to start with the definition that we're using for vulnerability. This is the definition that we use at Bank of America. I realize that each one of you may have a different definition within your organization, but today we're talking about it as being able to bring your whole self to work. Um, again, with, with respectable brown boundaries. Um, but bring your whole self, um, you know, to give people a sense of belonging, a seat at the table. Um, and it's really about identity when we're talking about inclusion, because I'm going to distinguish it from psychological safety. Okay. And why does it matter? In each situation, we're giving you the definition, but also why it matters. And this is the business case. And when you see the business case, I can't imagine many organizations saying, gee, you know, we can forgo inclusion here. But organizations are two times more likely to be profitable and have financial gains when they're more diverse and more inclusive. Specifically, we're talking inclusion. They're three times more likely to be high performing, six times more likely to be innovative and agile. And having been through the pandemic, I think all of us can agree in today's world, and there's also a political complex world outside of us, agility and innovation really matters to stay relevant and current and profitable. And then eight times more likely to have really good, positive, better business results. And what organization doesn't want better business results? So we'd like to bring our colleague Mia up to just share a story to kind of tie some of this together. Hey, everybody. <laughs> My name is Mia Rella, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm non-binary, transgender, uh, poly, neurodivergent. I'm also a financial planner here in the Merrill Lynch section of Bank of America. And feel free to step up, talk to me. I'm really approachable. I was planning to come out as non-binary to my team last year, and I was nervous. I didn't even know if it was going to be possible, so I talked to my supervisor first. Thankfully, uh, when I came up to my supervisor, he said, 
I want you to know that this is not going to be a problem for you. I want you to know that you've got me, you've got Bank of America behind you, you've got Merrill behind you, and anybody who has a problem with you, that's my problem to take care of and not yours. So I decided to come out. <laughs> I came out to my team in a 10 minute presentation about my story and pronouns. And I wound up offering that little 10 minute retraining every time we had a slew of new folks come in or every time we had a big amount of new teammates or any time people wanted it. I also held an open once per month time on everyone's calendar to come in and ask questions about gender, just in case. Was it a small group? Yeah, but it, we had some really great conversations. Now, what you expect is probably that all the LGBTQ plus people would come out to me, and they did. <laughs> what you would not expect is that I had a ton of other teammates identify me as their one safe secret keeper in our team. So I had teammates come out to me about their infertility journeys. I had a teammate share with me and nobody else that he was dealing with testicular cancer. And I had someone talk to me about a new mental health diagnosis. It's also good for business. In our area of the industry, you know, we've got these little cluster teams of peer support that help each other learn new things, develop best practices. And my team, my little cluster of four, wound up rising right to the top. We had more client meetings, we made fewer mistakes, and when there was new technology, we adopted faster and better than other clusters. So they wound up dividing up our cluster of four and now trying to multiply what we're doing. We are the new cluster leaders leading my group. It's all because... <laughs> But I felt better about coming out and better about taking more steps forward because my manager made that safe space for me and then others felt more comfortable being vulnerable to me because I had done it first. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. I absolutely love Mia's story because it really ties everything together and it makes the business case for this way better than any type of statistics you could have. So thank you so much, Mia, for sharing and being willing to be vulnerable in front of the group. It's really a great story. So now I'm gonna talk about psychological safety. And a lot of times, you know, we think it's the missing piece that organizations sometimes don't get. Um, that it's really, uh, sometimes they recognize, okay, you need inclusion, might be good to be vulnerable. But if you have psychological safety, it makes it much more viable. Um, and when we talk about psych psychological safety, I'm going to def define it in a moment, moment, but we really mean more to be able to voice who you are. So with inclusion, you might have a seat at the table, but are you comfortable speaking up? Do people hear you? Do they value your voice? So in terms of a definition from Amy Edmondson, she's a Harvard Business School leadership professor, and she's a thought leader in this area. She's got a great TED talk on this. Um, not as good as us, but it's pretty good. <laughs> um, but she defines it as you know, a climate where people really are comfortable expressing and being themselves, but we're emphasizing the expressing part. It's you know, being able to vocalize who they are. And you can see it goes farther than you might expect. It's not just, gee, I feel comfortable speaking up. It's actually feeling obligated to speak up if they see something wrong. So it's an ethical obligation, which is really important for managing risk in organizations, which we'll talk about in a minute. Being comfortable to share one's ideas um, and thoughts. Um, and this last one, with my mediation background, I will tell you people find this hard a lot, but being comfortable having difficult conversations. If you are on a team where it's okay to say something like, I don't know if that's such a good idea, but here's why, and not get shot down for saying it, it can be far more effective. And all of this leads to greater growth, greater learning, and greater innovation. So why does this matter? If you do not have psychological safety, you have silence and fear in your environment. And we're gonna talk in a minute about where that can really cause organizations to go wrong or teams to go wrong. If you do have psychological safety, as we've said, it can give you really high performing teams and innovation, which I'll talk about in a moment too. And as you can see, Amy says, when you're allowed to have robust, vigorous conversations, great things happen. So 
in terms of no psychological safety, imagine being in an emergency uh, surgery area where it's a life or death surgery. And if the surgeon's super tired, this is their fifth surgery, maybe they're starting to pick up the wrong equipment, go for the wrong organ, do something wrong, it can happen. Um, but if the nurse or the anesthesiologist or no one in the room is comfortable to say, uh, <clears throat> you're making a mistake there, or I, I think that's not quite right, it could literally be deadly. So it, it really matters. And then Aaron and I, we work in a risk environment in banking, not a risk, but a very highly regulated environment in banking. And if you have an environment in a regulated area where there's tremendous pressure to grow, to perform, without focus on managing risk, which means without an ability to speak up and say, hey, something's going on over here that's not right, you can get in super trouble with regulators, but you can also be breaking the law. You can ruin, really harm the reputation of your organization, lose a ton of money through fines, but also through losing customers. So it, it goes on and on. It's not life or death, but it still can have huge consequences. And you could lose your job if you're someone who you know, didn't speak up and you figured that out. Yeah, so we do a lot to create a, a healthy risk culture where people feel comfortable raising their hands, calling out risks. We even for each department line of business, you know, this idea of getting credit for every time you sort of have a self-identified issue, something that should be audited or improved, that sort of thing. Or we even measure um, annually in our engagement survey people's comfort and will it, feeling that they feel safe enough um, to, to raise concerns without any kind of negative consequences. So those are some of the things that help us create a very healthy risk culture. Yeah, and something I meant to mention with um, inclusion that feeds on what Aaron was just saying is, what you measure is what you get. So if you do things like measure you know, employee engagement, satisfaction, do they feel like they belong? It can touch on a lot of this stuff to help encourage it in your organization. So why, again, why does this matter? If you have psychological safety, you have so much more energy to do your job. It's similar to you know, if you're trying to cover who you are, you spend so much energy um, as Aaron showed in the statistics, once you stop covering, a lot of times you can be way more productive because you're actually able to focus on the work. And when, so when you do have psychological safety, you get much more dynamic, a much more of a dynamic culture, a lot more creative creativity. A dynamic culture can often attract people where people actually want to work with you. It creates innovation, which in today's ever-changing world is really crucial. And as we said, performance excellence as well. We also want to talk about what can block psychological safety. Um, it can lead people, if, if you're in an environment where you feel like you're gonna be judged, um, where if you're the bearer of bad news, you wanna protect yourself because you don't wanna look bad, you don't wanna be embarrassed. Um, if you feel your opinion isn't valued, sometimes people think, if I speak up, no one's gonna listen anyway, so why bother? So you have to be in an environment where it's encouraged to speak up and people actually listen. Listening is a very important part of this. And then the fear of harming work relationships, and we've probably all been, been, been in a situation, if you're, you have a leader and your team who really doesn't like to hear other opinions, you don't wanna ruin your relationship with your boss unless you're planning to move to another organization or team. Um, so that can really stifle it. And I would be curious, maybe if we go back to the slide for just a moment, anybody have anything else you would add to this list? What are some of the blockers to psychological safety that make you feel unsafe? Fear of retribution. Fear of retribution. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Historical consequences. Historical consequences. Yeah. Doubting yourself. Doubting yourself, yeah. absolutely. Isolation. Isolation. Not a member of the clique, we all know that one. <laughs> fear, of fear of disconnection. Being the squeaky wheel. Being the squeaky wheel. Yeah, having a bad reputation. Lack of curiosity. Lack of curiosity. Lack of allyship. Lack of precedent. Lack of precedent. Yep. And this self-doubt too, one of the things I tell people as a coach is when you're in a room at a meeting, think about your role there. Like if you represent a team or if a certain part of the project, if you can focus on that, sometimes you can find your voice and think of it, I'm here to present this perspective and if I don't, it's gonna harm the project and it's not, I'm not actually doing my job. And if you think about that rather than, should I speak up now, shouldn't I? Is this right? No. I don't, mm, I don't know if I have my thought formulated enough. Sometimes it can get people out of their head enough to, to share. 
Thank you, those were good ideas. And I just now want to shift to what can you do as an organization to create psychological safety? You can encourage speaking up and debate as we've talked about, and it can take the form of not being so focused about perfection or marking the task off, but focus on projects and what you're doing as a learning exercise. And when you do that, it's okay to fail because we can go and dissect the failure afterwards, learn from it, and get better. Um, something I wanted to mention before when we talked about uh, environments that do have psychological safety and what makes them really good, um, Google did this study that was pretty extensive with 400 people over four years. And the sole purpose of the study was, what distinguishes the super high-performing teams from the rest of the pack? And it wasn't good teamwork. It wasn't the best talent in the company. It wasn't the best leader. It was psychological safety. And they were surprised. That is not what they expected to find. So these are some of the things that they realized. And it even includes encouraging bad ideas and being prepared to respond to them, because a lot of leaders don't like bad ideas. They think they're a waste of time. So suppose I said a really bad idea, or an idea that Aaron really thought was a bad idea, and he shot me down. I was like, Julie, that's just stupid. So he's, he's ended the conversation. But if he uses his coaching skills, which involve asking questions to pull things out, he could say, well, why, why are you thinking that? Without condescension. Um, and then I could share, well, I was thinking this and I was thinking that, and it may be that I was solving the wrong problem with a really great solution, or I had a really bad solution, but for the right problem, and as we discuss, we come up with something together that's a, a great idea for the organization. Yeah, and it makes me think also of, uh, where are my improv friends somewhere in here? Uh, <laughs> this notion of, you may have heard of it with improv, yes and. So how as leaders can we receive and hear, or how as facilitators can we receive and hear ideas that may not be the ones we were thinking of, say yes and, and, and tell me more about that, also what you said in terms of coaching, but then and, and what else, and what else, and what do we think about this? There's ways of sort of taking that energy and receiving people um, that really makes that difference. Absolutely. Um, and then there's other, like we've talked about modeling vulnerability. It also, in addition to being willing to admit you don't have all the answers, it also gets back to being comfortable being uncomfortable, being willing and able to have difficult conversations. That's when you really create an environment where you can share and get to some really good solutions. And then building trust, which people have talked about the importance of building trust, it involves empathy, putting yourselves in other people's shoes, thinking from their perspective, and when they realize you're doing that, it can help build trust. It also, someone else mentioned this, you guys are pretty far along in this topic already, but someone mentioned, um, being willing to let people in. So if you have a wall, people distrust you. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, if you're, when Aaron was talking about being closeted in the workplace, I think some of us have probably, been, I've been there before, and I always thought, you know, people must think I'm so strange because they talk about what they did over the weekend and they hear nothing and they probably are filling in all these things and ideas about what I must be doing over the weekend because they have no idea. Um, so when the people get to know you, it builds a lot of trust. Accountability, similar to where we said you need boundaries when you're vulnerable, you need to have a context, you need to have a way of having boundaries around this idea of psychological safety. For psychological safety, it's the right amount of accountability. Now, if you just have psychological safety and no accountability, everybody's comfortable, having fun, doing their thing, but it's a certain amount in this comfort zone. It's not encouraging the growth and the innovation. You're not going to be a high-performing team. You're not going to be pushed to do your best. But if you're held accountable, given stretch goals, but also in a psychologically safe environment, then you can really fire on all cylinders. And then on the other side, if it's a high level of accountability but no psychological safety, I think we've all been in environments like that before, it creates a tremendous amount of anxiety, which is a waste of our energy and does not promote really high performing. And if you lack them both, you get a lot of apathy. Why bother? It's not a safe environment. They're not holding me accountable. So you get a lot of people coasting and really not producing a lot or creating an engaging environment where you're growing as an organization or personally. So just to kind of bring it back to this pyramid view, one builds on the other, the foundation of inclusion, psychological safety, maybe that missing layer oftentimes, and then the vulnerability. And the arrows on the side, just to remember, there can be a virtuous 
cycle that we can create that self-reinforces where the conditions were there, the vulnerability comes forward, the vulnerability creates more of the conditions. And hopefully those are the kind of organizations we can create, lead, and be a part of. We also want to give you another way to think about it, because there are definitely times when people can be vulnerable and not have psychological safety, not have inclusion. I think of some great change agents like Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi. They did not care if there was psychological safety, and there definitely was not. Um, they were not included, but they were able to create change. But that is a personal choice. It doesn't always work in the business context, but it's a choice that people can make. Um, you can have tons of inclusion, um, but not have that voice at the table, um, not be comfortable being vulnerable. Um, you can have the psychological safety. Maybe you're in a group where everybody's the same and they have the same kind of ideas and feel super safe, but you're missing these other pieces. Um, and it's not really vulnerable because they're all coming from the same point. Where you're really doing your best and you're unleashing your potential is when you can focus as a team, as an organization, as an individual, on where these all overlap. That's where you unleash your potential. And that, we will say, is where you have the potential to become fully unstoppable. <laughs>So we want to talk a little bit about best practices, and we're going to ask you all to share a few as well. But we're, we'll talk from the context of Bank of America. Um, and one of the ones that I think is so great that I learned about after I got here, it's called um, Courageous Conversations, also known as Let's Get Real. And what the organization does is they'll either have leaders of, say, a line of business or a team give them a packet on how to have a really challenging conversation and, and lead it in a safe way to open the conversation, uh, or we'll have panels of leaders that are accessible to everyone in the organization, virtually and some in person. Um, and it's amazing because they'll talk about things like racial equality, um, as you can imagine during the Black Lives Matter, um, when that was really flaring up, it impacts so many people so profoundly, and to be able to talk about it and feel safe at work and supported was really important. And they talk about LGBTQ+, we have tons of panels, um, to really try to expose people, because we feel like if people get to know you, it's a lot harder to hate you. Um, we also do, through the leadership development, we make sure that folks are learning these skills. And then we, also, we recruit diverse candidates, whether it's military, disabled, LGBTQ+, the whole range of underrepresented people, but also put things in place to try to support them so that we can retain and help people flourish. So there's many, many different ways to approach it. Um, we've had 350 different either courageous conversations, panels, outreach efforts where we believe we're, we've covered pretty much all 200,000 folks in the company worldwide in one way or another. We also want to emphasize employee networks, which a lot of you are probably either members of them or leaders of them. Um, and we focus on really building membership to help people understand we focus on intersectionality, encouraging people to join networks that they may not have an identity that specifically belongs in it, and also to join different networks that represent your different identities. For example, for me, the parent and care caregivers network has been exceptionally helpful. Um, but I've joined a whole bunch, and now I could use some clues on managing email. Um, <laughs> but I, they can be extremely effective and helpful and great sources of information. Aaron and I are on the LGBTQ plus Leadership Executive Council, so we have seven diversity leadership councils too, where we have executives in the organization to try to lead the way by being visible and helping um, to spread the word, so to speak, and lead by example. And here we just want to cover um, you know, some of the things you can do in your organizations. We don't have all the answers, but some ideas, right? So at an organizational level, this idea of building an inclusive culture, having diverse representation at all levels, for example, the employee networks and things like that. Um, really encouraging those constructive conversations and debates, rewarding new innovations and ideas, um, and things that are kind of identified at all levels in the organization. And that culture, again, how do you create that culture, really, of, of no stigma? Um, if things are called out, things weren't done perfectly, that we can actually raise our hand and, and call it out for ourselves. And then also we want to talk about what leaders can do. And again, as we've been emphasizing, 
it really works best when it starts from the top. Um, for if your leaders or you as leaders can model this, it's where it's gonna be the most effective in helping to shift a culture toward this. Um, and again, we've shared the business case. It can give you the best team. You know, as Mia found, it's definitely helped her career in a very positive way. So we've talked about modeling vulnerability, admitting you don't always have the answer, um, encouraging the difficult conversations, and there are definitely ways to do it with structure. There's ways to learn how to do that if it's not something that you're comfortable with. Um, acknowledging what you don't know, as we said. And as I've emphasized, listening. Encouraging questions, asking questions, but listening. Taking that step back. I think Aaron talked about it, stepping back and letting other people step into the space to speak and hear them. And I would also, this connects back to my background in mindfulness, teaching mindfulness, which I've done you know, at the Bank of America and outside, is this idea of how can we as leaders be mindful and present enough to really create a space? Because you can feel it when somebody's in a rush, when they're just trying to get you to the next point, when they're just trying to get to the next meeting. Where can we take that deep breath, listen? But it all starts with what's happening inside your own mind. So if you don't have sort of that grounded, present moment awareness, it's very hard to be a leader who's really going to inspire that sense of safety for others. And with Be Inclusive, I have this very unscientific sense that there are far more introverts in the world than we acknowledge. And in being inclusive, I think it's really important, again, to step back and give space and listen and encourage the folks on your team who are not speaking up. Because sometimes they have very brilliant things to offer, but they're chewing it through and actually thinking it through a lot more than those of us extroverts who figure things out while we're talking. So <laughs> encouraging that, thank you. <laughs> And there's a lot of research out there that introverts make phenomenal leaders, so I want to boost you all up. High respect. Um, and it also, we mean, if there's underrepresented folks around you, to help pull their voice out, support it, encourage it, so that you really get the value of the diversity and inclusion around you. And then this last one is really, what can all of us do, right? So we can practice vulnerability within boundaries, being conscious of that, of course, we may Sometimes step across lines, that's okay, right? Where none of us are trying to be perfect here, but to actually be conscious about how we're modeling vulnerability, being courageous. Um, a lot of what you said, right, about really recognizing and specific, thank you for sharing that, using the person's name, asking for input from all types of folks at the table, making sure they're at the table, and then really welcoming those directly. So again, with the spirit of we don't have all the answers, we'd love to hear what are things you would add to that list, maybe before we go to the Q&A, if we just for a moment, <laughs> If there's anything you would add to this list of things we can do to promote psychological safety, um, vulnerability, inclusion that you'd like to add from your organizations. Yeah. Um, a potential idea might be supporting uh, therapy for the mental health of your employees through yep. things like insurance. Yep. That's by the company. So supporting therapy through insurance provided by the company. I've got oh. you over here. Yes. Where do I want to be? Going back to self-acceptance, where am I? What do I want to be? Practice empathy. Practice empathy. That can get you a long way. Yes. Encourage employees to take mental health days. Encourage employees to take mental health days. And I consider this a mental health day, to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to open it up to Q&A. Yes. Hundred percent. So I'd love to hear what rebuttals or help we can have with leaders who are trying to make that space, but just with the statement alone, how can we help foster that? Yeah. So the question was, how can we help foster safe spaces when we have leaders who say this is a safe space, but it doesn't feel safe? Um, there are strategies to have difficult conversations in a safe way, and my first thought would be having a conversation with that leader in a safe way for you, right? Um, and that's something, a lot of it's talking about the behavior, not the person. A lot of um, psychological safety is created by focusing on the issue, not the individual. So it's, we're a team trying to solve a problem. We're not, you know, oh, that was a dumb thing, Julie, or whatever it is. It's like, you know, how do we solve that? Um, so it's being specific, 
talking about it soon after, um, and focusing on the actual issue, and also the impact, because a lot of people don't realize the impact. So in this case, with a leader like that, you could potentially show the business case of what it, first of all, the definition, what it re actually means, if they're receptive to that, um, and also why it's really beneficial. Another potential strategy is if it's not safe for you because they, there's a power dynamic, is if you have a mentor or someone who's an equal who may have a good rapport with them, who they respect, who might be able to help make the case for you. Because um, again, you want to be safe when you're vulnerable. You, you want to be smart about when you do it, like Aaron was explaining. You don't want to set yourself up um, you know, unnecessarily. If I could just add one thought to that Absolutely. too, is that having a standing item or standing agenda item on the, the meetings that you might have periodically to call out um, questions, mistakes, learnings, you know, that sort of thing to, to sort of know that you're gonna have that opportunity to give feedback. And then the biggest thing as a leader is you could have that item and you could ask the question, but then how you respond, people are gonna be paying so much attention. So that's again where you need to have that mindset and, and be ready with the things you'll say when people share things that are difficult so that you don't suddenly send a ripple wave throughout the organization of people just shutting down again. Because they're paying attention to every single word and interaction. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. So the question was, what's at our disposal in terms of statistics, like uh, employee engagement surveys and things like that, to help persuade managers or leaders? Yeah. Do you want to take that, or I can whatever. You well, want. yeah. I mean, it's something we look at. We have a DNI index um, in our survey, which includes items around I feel comfortable bringing my whole self to work, things of that nature. So if you're a leader, a senior leader, or any level, and you've got a score on that item or those other items that just is, is, is standing out from the rest of the organization as low, that certainly creates a level of accountability. So measurement, as you mentioned earlier, can mm -hmm. be a powerful strategy. And it's not a perfect science, so I can't say, gee, if it's 90%, it's phenomenal, but probably pretty good if it's 90%. If it's 60%, it's probably not great. Um, so even like if your whole organization is not psychologically safe and everybody's scoring 60%, it doesn't mean your manager's doing a great job. But I think most of us know from school you wouldn't associate a 60% score as an A+. Um, so you know you can kind of use it in that way. But you'd have to work with HR and the survey folks in your organization to even have them collect that data. I think maybe somebody has a mic. Is that right? Okay, yep. yeah. Yep. Oh, hi, this is Antonio from Peru. I work in Visa. I um, actually have a question for Mia um, regarding her experience. Uh, you really touched me because I feel the same. How do you handle the emotions of others sharing these important stories with you? Because that's really important for, I mean, when somebody leads an ERG or something, they are usually their point of contact to these type of stories and it gets an impact in us. So how do you deal with that? Like when someone shares something emotional with me, I'm an emotional person. So if someone tells me they're going through something, my usual answer is, oh my goodness, I understand what's going on. If you need a hug, you let me know, because that's the kind of person I am. And I think having a warm response when someone's being super vulnerable is important, because they need to know that they're not saying, and I'm going through this, and you're like, oh, that's, that's really rough. Like you need to bring a little bit of vulnerability back to make them feel like they landed in a safe place. And then if, I wasn't sure if you were talking about the emotional reaction or, or my emotions. It's also important for me to talk to other folks when big stuff gets revealed to me because sometimes it's a lot. And I don't want to make my processing of that part of the person's experience who just shared with me if I'm trying to be a resource to them. So in order to keep being a res good resource, I gotta go back and make sure I'm taking care of my own bucket so I can keep being that vulnerable person for them. It's putting that safety mask on. You can stay, at, Mia, you can stay in case they have other questions. But yeah, it's putting that sa emergency mask on in the airplane before you put it on your child or the person next to you. I guess yes. we have another mic. Yeah, thanks so much, Mia, for being here and sharing your story. I just will be really quick, and I'm shaking even saying it, but in the spirit of psychological safety, and by no means to vilify or condemn anyone, I do want to acknowledge that you're, you have been misgendered a couple times in this conversation. So I just think let's all, you know, hold ourselves accountable so that we can lead and model that for others. Thank you. Thank you so much.
question about diversity leadership council and the DSC. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the difference or the common points between those two departments? So the employee resource networks are available to anyone in the company, and anyone can join as many as they wish. The diversity, my understanding of the diversity leadership councils is that you have to be at a certain executive level in the company to be able to be in it, and the expectation is that whatever council it is that you will contribute to solutions for the organization, you will be visible, um, you know, you will help lead. An example was uh, soon after I joined and joined the uh, Executive Leadership Council, I was invited to sponsor a panel. So it wasn't, it was that sort of stepping back. It was setting the stage as an executive saying, this matters, but let's hear from your colleagues. Um, so, you know, it's sort of working in tandem, and sometimes we'll have access to upper level leadership to help with the thought leadership for our particular uh, representation. And you had a question? Yes. Um, like what approach they take to you know, like make the employee there? Yep. So the question is about how do we impact psychological safety, safety in global company, companies that have people in countries like China as one example um, that may not be as psychologically safe. Okay. There's a few ways to try to tackle it, and it's not easy, as you know. One is through HR practices. Um, but also through these employee networks, we try really hard to get people involved and provide a safe place for them to engage with an employee network, including, I mean, LGBTQ plus is a, a great example because there's certain countries where it's very difficult. And we actually had a meeting here yesterday, a breakfast meeting for Bank of America, and we had a gentleman here who's a heterosexual man, married to a woman, children in India, um, and he was invited to lead uh, the ERG and the um, LGBTQ plus uh, efforts and network in India. And he described how when he started this work, he, his child had just said, you know, Dad, you need to be a little more open-minded about this stuff the day before. And then he was invited to do this. It sort of primed him. And he's like, okay, so teach me, help me. And then his wife said, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? You know, you're going to be a pariah. Why? This is horrible. And she, over time, was able to get herself educated, and now he was saying she is the best advocate, and they've made a huge impact in India. And I think that's one of the things that's helpful, is if you can get people who aren't part of your underrepresented group to advocate for you, allies, 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 can really help. One of the things we did, I, I helped launch an ERG in a different organization, LGBTQ+, where it, LGBTQ+, had never been spoken by leaders, and it made a big impact. But we intentionally uh, did joint uh, efforts and programming with like the military group, the women's group, any group we could think of. And military sought us out because they said, people think we're homophobic and we don't want them to think that. So we worked together to help make inroads. Do we have any other mics, folks? Or raise your hand, we can bring you a mic. Yep. There's one back there. Hello, can you guys hear me? Excuse me, can yes. you, everyone hear me? Awesome. So I'm Tosin Ayabusi, I go by he, him pronouns. And the concept and the topic of vulnerability has always been a little tricky with me as an African-American male showing up in spaces in the corporate world that I'm generally not as seen or I don't have the same representation as others. Uh, it's the concept of vulnerability that makes me a little uneasy. I feel as if I have to show up without any chinks in the armor, so to speak. And I love how you contextualize uh, psychological safety with the framing of the pyramid, because I think the inclusion piece was very important, but for underrepresented talent who feel as if they have to show up and be good and, and absolutely phenomenal at all things, because statistics show that we're more prone to imposter syndrome and not being seen as worthy and being at a deficit uh, in terms of competence when we enter these spaces um, based on a lot of research widely held. Uh, how do you go about answering or even coaching talent uh, who may feel this way, maybe, albeit true or not, this is something that 
some individuals may struggle with, not speaking with all African American or BIPOC talent, uh, but it is prevalent. Yeah, and, and just to name, I just want to call out, I don't know that I have the answer to that, but we can talk about it, but the fact that being vulnerable in some ways um, can oftentimes rest on privilege, that those of us who have more privileges can take more risks, and we just have to be honest about that fact first. And I want to thank you for your honesty and your vulnerability. This is why it really starts at the top, um, and I would encourage you to look for allies folks who can help boost you and not carry that all on your shoulders. Because it's true, you don't want to be someone who's known as, you know, oh, we always know what this particular person's going to say or their perspective. You don't want to get put in a box. But if you can find allies that are peers, allies that are above you, you know, really look for guidance to help you uh, get what you need and hopefully help bring the business case if to the extent that you can to others who can help advocate for that. And I know such a wonderful question. I know we're out of time. I want to say thank you so much for coming here today for this rich conversation. Yeah, and, we'll, and we'll be around afterwards if you want to talk. Please take a minute to go on the app and fill out the survey. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear that again. But stay in touch. Thank you. Yes, participation.